If you've been a video tech viewer for some time, you may recall the March 1990 program in which we discussed the effects of R12 on the ozone layer and the need to recover and recycle R12 refrigerant to prevent its being discharged into the atmosphere. Welcome to Video Tech. The R12 recycling we talked about in 1990 is now required by law and as of January 1st, 1992, you must recover and recycle this refrigerant if you're going to service automotive air conditioning systems. But by now, you've probably heard of another step Chrysler's taking to avoid damage to the ozone layer, especially if you've been watching recent video tech programs. I'm referring to the use of a new refrigerant, R134A. In making R134A, the refrigerant in Grand Cherokee AC systems, Chrysler becomes the first automaker to use a substitute for R12 in a U.S. built vehicle. To see why R134A is better, we need to review what happens when R12 finds its way into the upper atmosphere. R12 refrigerant is a very stable chemical, one that, if released at ground level, can eventually find its way into the upper atmosphere. When R12 in the upper atmosphere breaks down, its chlorine atoms attack the ozone molecules there, breaking down the ozone shield against ultraviolet radiation. R134A, on the other hand, is less stable in the atmosphere and breaks down more quickly, so it is less likely to reach the ozone layer if it is released into the air. In addition, even if it does find its way to the upper atmosphere, R134A does not contain chlorine, which is so destructive to ozone molecules. The changes to the Grand Cherokee's AC system go beyond the use of a new refrigerant. Along with the switch to R134A, the Grand Cherokee features a new climate control system with new components. Both the R134A and the refrigeration components are the subject of the next part of this program. As mentioned earlier, R134A does not contain chlorine. It is not a chlorofluorocarbon, or CFC. Instead, it is a hydrofluorocarbon, or HFC. The most important thing to remember about R134A is that it cannot be used in R12 systems. And R12 cannot be used in R134A systems. The refrigeration system lubricants are also incompatible. The R134A system uses an oil with a synthetic base, polyalkylene glycol, PAG oil for short. Mixing the refrigerants or their oils in a system will create contaminants which can cause compressor seizure and orifice tube or expansion valve clogging. Because R134A has a greater tendency to penetrate seals, the seals on R12 systems also cannot be used on R134A systems. To help ensure that technicians do not inadvertently use R12 in an R134A system and vice versa, the Quick Connect high and low pressure service fittings on the Grand Cherokee and other R134A systems are not compatible with R12 service or diagnostic equipment. The low pressure charging port shown here is located just before the evaporator in the liquid line. The high pressure charging and service port is located under the AC compressor. The Grand Cherokee's compressor uses an aluminum swash plate to move 10 pistons and it has a fixed displacement. Keep in mind that although the Grand Cherokee's compressor may look similar to those used on some R12 systems, it is different and it is not interchangeable. Besides the high pressure service port, the compressor manifold has the high pressure relief valve. As in other systems, this valve vents refrigerant to atmosphere to reduce excessive pressure in the system. Downstream from the compressor is a high pressure cutout switch. This switch interrupts compressor operation when excessive pressure poses a threat to the system. The condenser on the Grand Cherokee is designed to provide better airflow and improved performance. And if you've worked on Eagle Premier AC systems, you should be familiar with these. Spring lock couplings. 
They're used at the condenser inlet and outlet. We'll look at how to connect and disconnect them later on. The orifice tube and liquid line provide a link between the condenser and evaporator. On the Grand Cherokee, they are one assembly. The Grand Cherokee's orifice tube serves the same purpose as those found on R12 systems, metering refrigerant. And like R12 orifice tubes, this one has a filter that must remain clear. To reduce the amount of hiss heard in the passenger compartment, the orifice tube is located very close to the condenser outlet. At the other end of the liquid line is the low pressure side charging port, referred to earlier. The Grand Cherokee evaporator uses a new plate and fin design to provide a larger cooling area and a more uniform refrigerant flow. Because of this design, it can provide a faster cool down. Like the condenser, the evaporator uses spring lock couplings at its inlet and outlet. Two suction lines link the evaporator to the compressor. In the middle of these lines are the accumulator and clutch cycling switch. If you've worked on the AC system on Eagle Premier, then you're familiar with these components. They perform the same functions on the Grand Cherokee. The accumulator prevents liquid refrigerant from reaching the compressor. Its desiccant also removes moisture from the refrigerant. Keep in mind that the accumulator for the Grand Cherokee uses a different desiccant than those used on R12 systems, and it is not interchangeable. The purpose of the clutch cycling switch is to keep evaporator temperature high enough to prevent water from freezing on the plates and fins. To accomplish this, the switch cycles the compressor clutch on and off, regulating the flow of refrigerant from the evaporator. When refrigerant pressure drops, the switch opens, cycling the clutch off. When refrigerant pressure rises, the switch closes, cycling the clutch on. When servicing the Grand Cherokee AC system, keep in mind that the fitting the cycling clutch switch screws into is not designed to be used as a service port, as it is on some R12 systems. We've mentioned the use of spring lock couplings on the evaporator and condenser. If you're familiar with Eagle Premier AC systems, then you've seen them before. The flared end of the female fitting slips behind the garter spring and cage of the male fitting. An indicator ring used during vehicle assembly can be reused to show that the coupling is engaged. As on Eagle Premier, you'll need special tools to disconnect the spring lock couplings. To disconnect the coupling, with the system refrigerant discharged into an approved recovery recycling station, place the correct size tool over the coupling. The spring release part of the tool must be positioned so that it can enter the cage opening. Then push the tool into the cage opening to release the female fitting from the garter spring. Pull the fittings apart and remove the tool. Before connecting a spring lock coupling, make sure that the garter spring is in the cage on the male fitting. You can place the indicator ring inside the cage if you decide to use it. Also, make sure that the O-rings are in place on the fitting. Now these O-rings are made of a special material and are not interchangeable with those used on R12 systems. Coat both sides of the fitting with PAG refrigerant oil and push the two halves of the coupling together with a slight twisting motion. You should hear a click when the coupling engages. If the indicator ring is used, it will pop off to show engagement. In covering the refrigeration system on the Grand Cherokee, we've been making some comparison to the system on the Eagle Premier. The comparisons hold true for operation as well. Let's briefly review what happens to refrigerant as it moves through the system. The AC system's compressor receives heat-laden refrigerant from the evaporator in the form of a cool, low-pressure gas. This cool gas is compressed into a hot, high-pressure gas. The rise in pressure will allow a heat exchange to be made in the condenser. Because of the elevated pressure, the hot refrigerant gas is allowed to condense into a liquid at a higher temperature than if it were not compressed. 
The refrigerant changes into a liquid while at the same time giving up a great deal of heat to the air flowing through the condenser. Just downstream of the condenser outlet is the orifice tube. As mentioned earlier, the orifice tube meters liquid refrigerant to the evaporator and allows a drop in pressure to occur. The orifice tube serves the same purpose as an expansion valve. With the drop in pressure, liquid refrigerant passing through the evaporator will change into a gas as it absorbs heat. The heat from the passenger compartment is actually boiling the refrigerant. There is a relationship between the temperature drop of the refrigerant across the evaporator and the amount of refrigerant in the system. This will come in handy later during diagnosis. From the evaporator, low pressure refrigerant gas and any remaining liquid refrigerant flow to the accumulator. The accumulator separates liquid refrigerant and oil from gas so that the liquid cannot damage the compressor. An orifice in the bottom of the accumulator allows small amounts of oil to flow to the compressor. The desiccant in the accumulator also removes moisture from the refrigerant. As explained earlier, the clutch cycling switch completes and interrupts the circuit for the compressor clutch as refrigerant pressure rises and falls to regulate the flow of refrigerant gas from the evaporator. This prevents the evaporator from icing up. We'll learn more about compressor clutch operation later when we look at its diagnosis. That briefly is how the Grand Cherokee refrigeration system works. But there's more to an AC system than the refrigeration components. The air distribution and control side of the system are subjects we'll turn to next. For the most part, the components used to distribute cooled or heated air to the Grand Cherokee passenger compartment are probably very similar to those you've seen in other vehicles. All Grand Cherokees use a heater AC unit housing which contains a blower motor, an evaporator core, if the vehicle has AC, a heater core, and four air doors, recirculating, temperature blend, floor defrost, and panel defrost. The blower motor resistor assembly is mounted on the unit near the passenger side kick panel and can be removed separately, as can the blower motor. On manual AC systems, the air doors are operated by vacuum actuators, with the exception of the temperature blend door, which is moved by an electric motor. A new automatic temperature control system is standard on Grand Cherokee Limited. Now on this system, all of the air doors are moved by electric motors. One electric motor controls the floor defrost and panel defrost air doors, as opposed to two separate vacuum actuators on the manual system. One air distribution feature on the Grand Cherokee which should prove popular is the side window demisters, which route air through the doors and up to the side windows. Another is the rear floor heat duct, which routes air to the back seat. To get a better idea how the air distribution system operates, let's look at airflow in a manual system with the air conditioning and panel outlets selected. The temperature control knob is not in the recirculating position. Since the temperature control knob is not in the recirculating position, the recirculating air door is in the outside air position. The blower draws air from outside the vehicle and sends it through the evaporator core where it is cooled and dehumidified. The temperature blend air door is in a position that corresponds to the relative position of the temperature control knob. In this case, most of the air is bypassing the heater core. Since the panel outlets have been selected, the floor defrost door is in the defrost position and the panel defrost door is in the panel position. As you can see from the air distribution example, the controls on the manual AC system are straightforward. There's a fan speed selector, a mode selector, an AC select button, and temperature control knob. When the temperature control knob is turned fully counterclockwise past the detent position, recirculating air is also selected. As mentioned earlier, the manual system uses vacuum actuators to control all the air doors except for the temperature blend air door. 
so the mode selector is really a vacuum switching device. The temperature blend door responds to the position of the temperature control knob, which controls a servo motor. Now the automatic temperature control, or ATC system, is quite different from the manual system we just looked at. The blower control allows manual selection of blower speed plus low and high auto positions. The auto positions allow the ATC system to select blower speed for optimum heating or cooling. Low and high provide two different blower speed ranges. The mode selector provides a mode selection or auto. In either case, the ATC system will automatically maintain a set temperature. The temperature control knob on the panel allows an operator to select a temperature setting, which then appears on the display above the selector. The display also indicates what mode has been selected and whether AC and recirculating air are selected. The buttons for AC and recirculating air are below the display panel. It's important to remember that in the manual modes, an operator must select AC to cool down the passenger compartment to a desired temperature. Now, it probably won't come as a surprise to you that the ATC system uses a control module. The module is part of the control panel. The switches we've been discussing act as inputs to the ATC module. Other inputs include the in-car temperature sensor and solar sensors located in the instrument panel and the ambient temperature sensor located on the radiator support. On the basis of its inputs, the control module activates outputs such as the blower motor and air door. Besides its inputs and outputs, the ATC controller communicates with other control modules on the C2D data bus network. This system was covered in the November 1991 video tech release, Jeep Eagle Electrical Update. By means of the bus, the ATC module is able to supply the overhead console with temperature readings. The C2D bus network also allows the ATC module to receive information about vehicle speed, engine RPM, and coolant temperature from the powertrain control module. The operation of the ATC system involves much more than we can go into in this program, but keep an eye out for a separate program on ATC in the future. Next, we're going to look at some precautions and required procedures you'll need to be aware of when servicing the refrigerant system on the Grand Cherokee. Just as with an R12 system, there are certain safety precautions you'll need to take during diagnosis and service of a system using R134A. First, to shield your eyes from R134A, wear eye protection when working on the refrigerant system. To prevent frostbite, do not allow refrigerant to contact exposed skin. And never breathe in the mist from R134A or from the refrigerant oil. Although R134A itself is a non-toxic chemical, if sufficient quantities are released in a small area, it could displace the air and cause suffocation. So always make sure your work area is well ventilated. When working around refrigeration systems, always keep in mind that exposing refrigerant to a flame could create a poisonous gas. So don't smoke or use a flame type leak detector for diagnosis. And never pressurize an R134A system with air to check for leaks. Doing so may create a flammable, possibly explosive mixture in the system. In addition to taking steps to protect yourself, there are procedures you'll need to follow to prevent damage to your customer's vehicle and to the environment. As we explained earlier, never use R12 refrigerant or refrigerant oil in an R134A system, and never use R134A or PAG oil in an R12 system. The interaction of the refrigerants and refrigerant oils will create contaminants which could cause damage to AC system components. On Grand Cherokee, the underhood label specifies the type of refrigerant and oil in the system and lists the part number for the PAG oil. Never use R12 components on R134A systems and never use R134A components on R12 systems. 
For one thing, the seals and refrigerant oils for the two systems are not compatible, nor are the hoses and refrigerants. Make sure any service or diagnostic equipment is designed to be used with the system you're working on. R134A systems, such as on the Grand Cherokee, are distinguished by their quick connect fittings. R134A manifold gauge sets, recovery and recycling stations, and charging stations have corresponding quick connect fittings and can be distinguished by the black stripes. Finally, just as on an R12 system, use approved recovery and recycling equipment when discharging an R134A system. For warranty work, Chrysler requires recycling and reuse of R134A refrigerant as well as the R12 refrigerant used in other systems. Chrysler strongly recommends recycling for all your work. Next, we'll look at some of the steps you'll need to take when diagnosing the air conditioning system on Grand Cherokee. Even though the Grand Cherokee uses a different refrigerant, troubleshooting the system is a lot like troubleshooting other AC systems. Your first step is to obtain a description of the problem. The description may or may not narrow down the cause. For example, insufficient cooling can indicate a problem with blower speed or air door actuation or the refrigeration system. As a result, you should try to obtain as accurate a description as possible. Then, inspect the AC system components for obvious signs of damage. Check the condenser tubes for crimping and the fins for obstructions. Check the compressor pulley for discoloration due to belt slippage. And check the drive belt for cracks or glazing. Check refrigerant lines and hoses to make sure that they're not kinked, bent, or ruptured. Check component connections for tightness and for evidence of refrigerant oil, which could indicate a leak. Also check the electrical connections at the compressor and at the clutch cycling pressure switch. If your preliminary inspection fails to reveal any obvious problem, it's time to run an AC performance test to confirm the customer complaint. To perform the test, first make sure the manifold gauge set valves are closed and the gaskets at the ends of the hoses are in good shape. Then remove the cap from the high pressure service port under the compressor and connect the quick connect fitting on the end of the high pressure hose to the port. Next, select AC and recirc on the control panel and set the temperature control to low. The mode selector to panel and the blower speed to high. Now start the engine and set engine speed at 1,000 RPM. Verify that the compressor clutch is engaging and allow the engine to warm up. The vehicle windows must be down to maintain a heat load on the AC system. After verifying airflow from the panel outlet, insert a thermometer into the left center panel outlet. Operate the system for five minutes. Depending on ambient conditions, the compressor clutch may cycle off. If it does, remove the cycling switch connector and place a jumper wire across the connector terminals. After five minutes, record the temperature reading on the thermometer and the pressure reading on the high pressure gauge. We'll look at the significance of these readings later on in the program. Suppose though that prior to completing the test, you had been unable to verify compressor clutch cycling or there was no airflow from the panel outlet. In either case, you'll need to investigate further. Let's take a closer look at each, beginning with the compressor clutch. When a compressor clutch doesn't engage until you jump the clutch cycling switch connector, the cause is probably the switch itself or low refrigerant. We'll look at verifying low refrigerant later on in the program. If the clutch doesn't operate, even with the connector jumped, check for voltage at terminal 17 of the compressor clutch relay in the power distribution center. Lack of voltage may be the result of an open in the relay fuse in the power distribution center or an open in the high pressure cutout switch, which you'll need to check for continuity. 
That should help you check out the part of the compressor clutch circuit that leads up to the relay contacts. But what about the side of the circuit that activates the relay coil? The coil side of the relay is controlled by the powertrain control module, which depends in turn on an AC select signal from the AC controls and on an AC request signal. An open in the AC select signal circuit which runs between terminal 28 of the PCM and terminal C6 on the control head will prevent compressor operation. An open in the AC request circuit that runs between the high pressure cutout switch and terminal 27 of the powertrain control module may also be interfering with compressor operation. Any other problem in this side of the circuit should show up as a fault message on the DRB2 which you can troubleshoot using the procedures in the powertrain diagnostic procedures manual. Finally, if the clutch coil is not operating, but voltage is present across the clutch coil connector and ground, use the clutch coil tests in the service manual to track down the cause. Similarly, if the compressor clutch is noisy or doesn't turn properly, use the charts in the service manual to troubleshoot the problem. Keep in mind that if your troubleshooting causes you to replace a compressor that was damaged internally, you'll need to replace the orifice tube and liquid line and the accumulator as well. If you do replace components, you'll need to add refrigerant oil to ensure that the system has the recommended amount. For example, if you're replacing a compressor, first empty the new compressor of its oil. After measuring the amount of oil in the old compressor, pour the same amount of fresh oil back into the suction port of the new compressor. If other components are being replaced, you'll need to add the amount of PAG oil specified in the service manual for each component to the suction port of the compressor. Finally, if refrigerant oil has leaked from the system, you'll need to verify the refrigerant oil level using the procedure in the service manual. Next, we'll need to look at the procedures you'll need to use if there was insufficient airflow from the panel outlets during the AC performance test. If the panel outlets fail to provide a sufficient flow of air, the fault is either in the air distribution system or in the AC system controls. The steps you take to troubleshoot the symptoms will depend upon whether you're working on a manual or ATC system. Let's take a look at troubleshooting a manual system first. If the symptom is a blower motor that doesn't operate on some or all speeds, use the charts in the service manual to track down the cause. The circuit is one you may be familiar with. Switches in the control head and an internal blower motor relay supply current to the blower switch which then routes it directly to the fan motor for high, or through one or more resistors for lower speeds. Should the symptoms indicate that a mode door is the problem, there are procedures in the service manual for checking the vacuum control circuits. When troubleshooting a vacuum supply problem, don't forget to check the vacuum reservoir for the system located under the battery. A temperature blend door that is not operating properly is another potential cause of insufficient cooling, so be sure to check its operation. The onboard diagnostics on the ATC system can save you a lot of time and trouble during troubleshooting. When the onboard diagnostics detect a fault in the system, ER is displayed momentarily on the control panel display every time the ignition key is turned from the off to the on position. To access the fault codes, you must enter diagnostics. With the key on, press the AC and recirc buttons simultaneously while rotating the temperature control knob clockwise one click. At this point, the display will light up for the segment test. Releasing the buttons and then pushing either button will cause a stick man and fault codes to appear in the display. There are two types of fault codes. Current faults are those that are in the system right now. Historical faults have occurred in the past, went away, and have been stored in the ATC module's memory. All of the faults are listed in the service manual. The two types are differentiated by the two ranges of numbers assigned to them.
Current faults are erased whenever you correct the problem causing them. Historical faults are cleared by pressing either the AC or research button when in the fault mode and holding the button for three seconds. A double bar will appear when the fault is cleared. Besides accessing fault codes, you can use the onboard diagnostics to test inputs and outputs and actuate components. To access these tests, after entering diagnostics, turn the temperature control knob until the desired test number appears. In this case, the test provides a reading from the ambient temperature sensor. Pressing the AC or RECIRC button then displays the value of the input or output. Performing actuator tests is just as easy. First, access the output value for the circuit. Then to press the AC or RECIRC button again to enter the actuator test. On automatic tests, you press the button just once, while manual tests require you to hold the button down. Refer to the service manual for charts detailing the circuits you can test and the values that are displayed. Also be sure to read the explanation of the significance of the arrows around the stickman figure in the display. The position of the arrows helps to determine the value of the display. For example, suppose that you're checking engine coolant temperature, a reading of 10 degrees on the display, along with a panel and defrost arrow by the stick man, indicates 210 degrees. A future Videotech program will deal with ATC diagnostics in greater depth. Right now, let's go back to our AC performance test and look at the steps we'll need to take if the compressor clutch and the air distribution and control systems are all right. Earlier in the program, we said you'd need to record the temperature reading taken from the panel outlet and the pressure reading from the compressor discharge port. You can determine whether the refrigeration system is doing its job by comparing your results to the chart in the service manual. If the readings fall within the values shown on the chart, performance is acceptable. In such a case, the cause of the complaint might be unrealistic expectations of the system on extremely hot, muggy days. If the high pressure gauge read atmospheric pressure when it was connected, or if the panel air temperature is the same as ambient temperature, the system is empty. To leak test an empty system, you'll need to first evacuate the system, then install a partial charge. On AC charging stations such as the one here, the recovery and recycling station, vacuum pump, and charging station are combined in one unit, and the functions are programmed into the machine. The low pressure hose of the unit is connected to the low pressure charging port near the evaporator inlet. The high pressure hose is connected to the high pressure service port under the compressor. The machine is then programmed to evacuate the system and to install 10 ounces of refrigerant as the partial charge. Once the charge has been installed, use an electronic leak detector to check for leaks. The service manual contains a diagram detailing the points at which leaks are most likely to occur. You can also check the evaporator for leaks by setting the mode selector to floor and the blower speed to low and then depressing the recirc button. Then check the left and right heater outlets with the leak tester probe. Refrigerant oil which has accumulated outside of fittings is another good indicator of a leak. Once you've discovered the leak, discharge the system into an approved R134A recovery recycling station following the manufacturer's instructions. After you've repaired the leak, you'll need to evacuate the system and charge it with 28 ounces of R134A. Follow the instructions provided with the equipment when doing so. If the panel outlet temperature during the AC performance test indicated that the system was low, but not empty, you'll first need to leak test the system with an electronic leak detector as described earlier. Most leak repairs will involve discharging the system into a recovery recycling station and then opening the system up to make the repair. Then, when evacuating the system, you can verify the repair by seeing if the system will hold the vacuum. 
In some cases, though, leak repair will not involve opening up the system, such as when refrigerant has leaked by a clutch cycling switch that was loose. In such cases, one way of bringing the system back up to full charge is by discharging, evacuating, and recharging the system as described earlier. There is, however, another way of bringing the system up to full charge. This method can also be used if system charge was low, but you failed to find a leak. To perform this procedure, you'll need to use one or two VOMs with accompanying thermocouples. Or you can use the Fluke 52 digital thermometer, which will monitor temperature at two locations and then automatically compute the difference. To begin the procedure, attach a high pressure gauge to the high pressure service port. Make sure the gauge set side valves are closed. Attach the temperature probes to the evaporator inlet and outlet tubes, just before the quick connect fittings. If you have only one probe, attach it to the inlet. Next, set the AC controls to AC, recirc, low temperature, panel mode, and high blower. Lower the vehicle windows to maintain a heat load. Then start the engine and allow it to reach normal operating temperature. You may need to jump the clutch cycling switch connector to keep the compressor clutch engaged. Next, set engine speed to 1000 RPM. And after allowing 10 to 15 seconds for readings to stabilize, record the evaporator inlet and outlet temperatures and compute or record the temperature differential. If you're using only one probe, you'll need to record the reading, then move it from the inlet to the outlet and allow the reading to stabilize before recording the outlet reading. Also record the high pressure gauge reading. Compare the high pressure gauge reading to the chart in the service manual. If the pressure recorded is equal to or lower than that in the chart, you can proceed to use the temperature readings to bring the system up to full charge. For example, if the ambient temperature is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, the inlet temperature is 37 degrees Fahrenheit, and the outlet temperature is 50 degrees Fahrenheit, the outlet is then 13 degrees warmer than the inlet. To find the amount of refrigerant that must be added, use the temperature differential chart in the service manual. First, locate the column that indicates the ambient temperature and follow it down to the box with the temperature differential you recorded. The beginning of the row then indicates the additional amount of refrigerant that must be added. In this case, 10 ounces. If the compressor discharge pressure was high, either during the inlet and outlet temperature check or during the AC performance test, you'll need to troubleshoot the system. Using the chart in the service manual and the temperature differential readings. If the temperature differential is higher than normal, the problem is most likely inadequate compressor performance or a restriction in the system. If the temperature differential is normal or low, the cause is most likely an inoperative viscous fan or an overcharged system. Below the chart in the service manual are repair procedures for correcting the problems. Be sure to verify these or any other repairs by performance testing the system afterwards. Well, that's about it for this month's program. The most important thing to keep in mind when working on the Grand Cherokee's AC system is that it really is new, and so it requires different equipment and procedures than other systems. For more information on air conditioning systems, consider enrolling in the classes provided by Chrysler Service Training. They're listed in the new updated course selection guide. Tune in next month when the subject will be the Grand Cherokee 5.2 liter engine.